morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the um, organizing committee for inviting me here today to share with you about palliative care. Um, I am a pediatrician, but I do see adults for the last um, four plus years now. So I'm Lee Ai. I work at Costas Malaysia, and we see um, a lot of adults and a few children. So we're trying to encourage our pediatricians to refer for uh, palliative care in the community. Anyway, to, to start, so um, I think often when you hear about palliative care, it's death. We are the death doctors, isn't it? It's like, I'm not dying yet, don't refer me to palliative care. You know, that's, that's a terrible word. Um, so hopefully in the next 20 minutes, um, we will perhaps change your perception and improve your understanding about palliative care. So palliative care and what we do, or the principles of palliative care, is not new to medicine. Maybe it's got a fancy name now, palliative care. But what it actually is, is not new. Um, let's look at the story of healthcare. Maybe in the past 100 years, so in the 1900s, um, what did we have? We had a lot of infectious disease, right? Um, people died very uh, often. The average lifespan in the 1900s is about 40s. You know, maybe half of us will be all dead already if we lived in the 1900s, right? Because there was a lot of infection, but there was also heart diseases, cancer, stroke, things that we, they couldn't cure, right? Infectious disease because they, they had no idea how to control it. And there were also diseases they couldn't cure. So a lot of people died. But, you know, even then, there were hospitals. They cared for adults. They cared for children. Um, they were comforted. They were, you know, cured. I mean, treatment was being provided. People cared for, for these sick people. Um, they made home visits. So that, that was medicine then. Even if you weren't curable, people cared, right? Um, so we move on since then. There is good public health. There's good sanitation, clean water. Um, vaccines, antibiotics, so a lot of the infectious disease were now extinct. A lot of them don't exist anymore because of those efforts, so less people died. Um, and also, medical technology has improved. Now you can anesthetize people, you can perform those surgeries that you couldn't do before, and then you have improved in surgery techniques, you have radiotherapy for cancers, you have new drugs, you have chemotherapy, you have drugs for heart diseases, you have drugs for respiratory illnesses. So we have improved. So that's why now the average lifespan is about 80 or 78 thereabouts. So from 40 in 100 years, we've moved on to 80s. So, so that's why we are all doing well now. And then we think we are immortal, maybe. You know, when you, when you have an illness, you don't think, you don't think you're going to die from it. Because, you know, healthcare is such that we are improving all the time. You know, we can cure everything. We can make everyone better. Um, and we think nobody dies. But we do. So some, some diseases are still incurable. Few, but not as many as before. But there are still diseases. But healthcare hasn't changed. We still have hospitals. We still care. Whether you're incurable or not, there are hospitals. We care for people. Um, we do home visits, we care for children. So it hasn't quite changed in a way. Maybe the emphasis is a little different. So what, so what is important? You know, whether you're incurable or not, you have illness or not, you are important. So you matter because you are you, right? We concentrate on the person. And this is what Dame Cicely Saunders says. And she's the founder of um, the Modern Palliative Care. She kind of gave it a name, this, this medical support, medical care became, became a name. Um, and so very important is you are the most important person and that's what healthcare professionals should know. And you should know that, right? Don't let them brush you off. I'll share a video with you.
different. So um, I think what the video kind of shows is most of you in the audience you know, can relate to some of it. You have gone through a lot of, I mean, this is not exhaustive. It could be varying from symptoms to how, whether you're sad, frustrated, things you've gone through when something hits you hard, um, like a serious illness. Um, and how, how do you cope? Who's there to help you cope with this? How do you tease it all out in this chaos that, that you have experienced once you've been told of something really bad that's happening? Um, and sometimes if you are ill, um, we want to be more than just our disease, right? If you've got prostate cancer, you don't want to say, hey, that's a prostate cancer guy who's coming and he's going to be admitted to so-and-so bed. You want to be seen as the whole, as a person, right? Mr. So-and-so, right? Um, so a lot of times we forget and then we are just the disease. We forget we are the whole person. So, you know, care for the person is important because we are, we are us, right? And the disease is only a small part of us, okay? but it does affect us. So it affects each of us in a different way. We may all have the same disease we had, um, but we are different. And our family, as we go through this chaos, how is our family taking this? We, we are, they are the brunt of our emotions and, our, and they are caring for us. How do they cope? So palliative care is an extra layer of support. You have your primary doctors who, who are taking care of you and your illness, and um, palliative care provides that extra layer of support to the whole person. Um, helps you define what is your quality of life, help, help you work towards it, um, help you reduce whatever suffering you have, physical, emotional, you know, we have Dr. Paul talking later, psychological or spiritual. Um, that's you as a whole person. You are not just your disease. Um, and, and helping you live better. Help giving you information to make the choices so that you can live the life you want to. So this is a, a teacher of doctors who said many years ago, it is much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than just what sort of disease the patient has. It's already recognized then medicine, we should recognize the person rather than the disease itself only. So in palliative care, communication is one of the most important things. And I'm, I'm sure you've got experience about bad communication. You've heard news that was told to you very badly and you still remember it till now. Um, we have patients who said, you know, it was so terrible, I, you know, nightmares. I still hate that doctor. I'm never ever going to see that doctor again. And I'm sure you have that experience too. So, you know, we need to work on our communication, work on our listening skills, um, work on the words we say, and the pace that you are, people are ready to take that information. So, you know, we, we have different thoughts because we are different people. Um, we sing different songs, we like different songs, but do the people taking care of us listen? Do they hear what we say? Do they listen carefully to what we want and what's important to us? Um, and are we more than just, I've said this many times, are we just more than just our disease? Do we want to be respected? Do we want to be treated with dignity? Is that our right? So in UK, Macmillan Group, some of you may know the Macmillan Group, they, they are very involved in support for cancer and palliative care. And they have had this challenge for themselves. By two, 2030, the 4 million people who will be living in, with cancer in UK will be able to say, I was diagnosed early. So you have cancer groups here, proponents of screening, you know, that it is out there. So you are able to have good health care. You were detected early, treated early, and um, you were, um, have good information to make the decisions that are important for you. And you got the treatment for your disease and the care for yourself, right? Um, and also those around you who are caring for you, are supported, your family, your friends, um, also are able to support you, and you're treated with dignity and respect, um, and you know what you can do to help yourself, you have information, you, you uh, can take care of yourself, and you can enjoy life. I mean, that's what, we only have one life, you know. If you have cancer, doesn't mean you can't enjoy life. So, to, co to be able to concentrate on that, to have someone help you work it out so that you can enjoy your life, and um, to be, part of society, to live 
um, normally to contribute to society, to leave a legacy for your children, for society, you know, your, your wishes. And if your disease comes back, incurable, um, you want to die well. Well could be anything. Every one of us have a different meaning of well, but at least that's respected. So palliative care is not just end of life care. It's not care of somebody who's dying. It's a lot more prior to your death. So this is another um, doctor who said, the tragedy of life is what dies inside a man while he lives. So the, we don't want to die, die while we're alive. We want to live the way we want it to. We want our lives to be, right? So that's kind of palliative care, the support that palliative care gives. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, palliative care in Malaysia. So um, palliative care in Malaysia has existed since the 1990s, mainly in the community. Some of you may know um, NGOs who've started up um, doing home visits um, in the 1990s. So Hospice Malaysia is one of those um, organizations. And this year is our 25th anniversary. So you might have seen in the news about um, our um, campaign for awareness and our celebration of our 25th um, anniversary. So we are community-based and there are a lot of community-based existing since then and these are independent NGOs. So we're not related, unfortunately. We, we, are, we all provide palliative care but we're not kind of related. So Hospice Malaysia um, provides care within the Klang Valley. Um, and then there are other com <coughs> providers around the country and uh, some of them are registered with Malaysian Hospice Council, and some aren't. Um, and with Malaysia, there, are, there is no regulation, as you heard earlier. There's no standards as such yet. So the scope of palliative care provided by each of these um, providers are different, unfortunately. Um, and then you can receive palliative care in the hospital as well. So Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Sabah started, was the first inpatient service in 1990s. And now you have an inpatient service, palliative care inpatient service in UN and also in Salayang. So Richard Lim, Dr. Richard Lim is the national advisor for palliative care in the country or for KKM and he's based in Salayang Hospital. Then there are other, you still can receive palliative care even though they don't have an inpatient unit, they <coughs> consult. So the palliative care specialist can go to the oncology ward, can go to the cardiac ward, can go to the respiratory ward to provide that extra layer of support to the primary carer. So they can consult, um, be consulted. Um, yeah. So there are several hospitals with the service from Alosta, Ipo, in IKN with Dr. Gerardis, um, HUKM as well. And then there are other physicians who have an interest in palliative care. Um, they also provide some palliative care. So most of your physicians are doing that. They are trying to understand you, improve your quality of life and see what you need, reduce your symptoms and help help you live better. So there are already physicians out there with that interest. Um, so I think the point is you want to celebrate life, right? If you have an illness, you want to celebrate that journey, your life with the illness. And in that journey, um, we need to kind of look at it and say, what are your priorities? You know, even if you did not have an illness, what are your priorities in life? You know, what are your wishes? Um, what do you hope for? What, what is tomorrow like for you? Sunday, are you going to sleep in, do something with your family? You know, to kind of think about things because otherwise the day just moves on. Um, what do you want your future to be? And how do your families and friends play a role in your life? Um, so advanced care plans, you know, it empowers you to decide what you want for yourself. Um, you know, to have a discussion, to understand your health, to understand your future, um, what is important to you. And, and if you can't make decisions for yourself, who, do, who knows you best, who can make the best decision for you? And have this discussion with your family, your doctors, whoever, um, so that you have a plan right? and you're not caught. So coming back to um, where palliative care is in Malaysia, in May 2014, the World Health Assembly, which is part of the World Health Organization, um, approved this this um, resolution and we, are, we should be quite proud to say Malaysia was one of the proposers for this to say that healthcare systems 
um, need to include palliative care as a component of treatment for patients with life-limiting illness. So it has to be integrated. You don't have to be afraid of it. You know, if you've got a heart disease, if the doctor writes a referral to the cardiologist, you're not going to say, no, 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 don't, don't refer me to cardiologists. If you have a life-limiting illness and you need holistic care or extra support, why don't you want it, right? Why is it so scary to say, don't refer me to palliative care? Right, so that's, that's what palliative care is, and that's what um, WHO is trying to promote um, and to, to overcome that fear and, and to be integrated in general health care. Um, but as you know, what we say outside and what we implement, totally different, right? So we haven't, that's why we haven't seen as much in the country moving palliative care forward. Very slow, but not that much. So my last slide, because um, my 20 minutes is kind of up. So what is palliative care, right? If you have a life-threatening illness, you think your life may be shortened. It could be 10 years, it could be five years, it could be a few months, um, but you have this illness. Um, we want to try and improve your quality of life. We want to try and reduce your suffering. It could be physical symptoms, right? We want to try and help you reduce your pain, your shortness of breath, your nausea, your vomiting. Um, or, you know, try to help you with, with your worries, your sadness, you know, your understanding on what's the meaning of this, um, and also be very patient-centered, meaning we want to know you and what you think the best health care for yourself is um, as you're going through this, this journey with illness. Okay, I think that's, that's my talk. Thank you. Maybe the audience would like to ask some questions while um, he sets up for the next speaker. Do you have any questions for her? Yeah. 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 Nursing care insurance for people above 50, they, they take that kind of insurance so that, you know, if something happened to them, then they can get nursing, uh, proper nursing services, you know, without going to palliative care. So this is one of the things that Malaysia, of course, do, do not have, which is a bit sad. And the other thing is uh, living, uh, living trust, will, yeah, which is also they have in U.S. When the person is uh, not capable of um, making decision, somebody else can make decision for the person. So, so it's, these are the things that perhaps uh, you know you, you being in, in this in this industry could be you know pushing for something like this. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for that that comment. It's um, it's it's uh, important what you brought up about how we support how we get support for ourselves. So. So America is totally different thing. So palliative care, hospice care is totally different because of the insurance scheme. So in America, hospice means you have to have only six months um, prognosis and you are not on any treatment. Then you qualify for hospice um, care and then they will, your insurance will pay for whatever um, is regarded as hospice. As long as you're not receiving any curative treatment, um, not even radiotherapy, not even palliative radiotherapy, and the doctor says you have six months. So the definition of hospice and palliative care is different in different countries. Um, the nursing support, I mean, that's quite, I wouldn't say universal because Malaysia doesn't have it, but in the UK, Australia, and, and um, America, you, have, you can hire um, care, nursing care, or whatever, whatever care you need. If you need rehab, they will go in. So somebody assesses you and say, fine, you need rehab. You need two hours a week of rehab. We will pay for it. The insurance will pay for it. Um, if you need nursing care, you need somebody to come and shower you and bathe you. Okay, fine, every day of the week or five days a week. So somebody will do that assessment and say, this is your care package. You deserve five days a week of nursing care, you deserve two days of rehab, um, whatever. And, and you get respite. So it's good for the families. They don't have to care for their, their loved one for 24 hours a day. You can get respite because family is also important. So it's, it is integrated into their healthcare system. Um, 
and because it's, it's social healthcare. So in Malaysia, um, you are it. You know, you are the nurse, you're the rehab, you're the respite, you are everything for your loved one. There is, you, can, you can approach a social worker and say, can you help me? But social workers in Malaysia tend to be more involved with finance. Right? They kind of try and help you with money, buying equipment maybe, um, paying for your drugs. But that's not much about um, nursing service or rehab or providing respite. So um, where, where are we in Malaysia? How do we push for that? I think it's just a whole structure. We, we need to change our whole healthcare system. Can we afford? to provide people with two hours a week of, of nursing care. Right. So that's that's an issue. Um, just a minute, what was the second issue? I forget now. Living yes, living trust. Yes, we talked about a little bit about that, advanced care plans. So in Malaysia, it's not there's no advanced care directive, which is a legal document that says specifically, if I'm not able to make decisions, these are the people I want to. But we can try to um, start talking about it so that your family knows what your wishes are, how, what are your beliefs, your expectations, what, what, what's important to you. Then, then your family can have the discussion with the doctor. So we don't, we don't have that as a legal document, but it is encouraged um, and, and most doctors start to, do, to have those conversations. Yeah. And that's what the advanced care plan was about. Yes. Sorry, you need a mic. Yeah, thank you so much. Should we go to the, oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's just that we are, you know, we're quite behind time. So, Ella? Okay. It's just a short one. We had, we had a discussion. We were invited for a discussion by MOH uh, on a, we were as stakeholders. And we actually put forward the issue of home care services to be provided by mainstream MOH, uh, at least to have attendance or somebody like that. Uh, areas of respite care and also uh, people who are ill and they can't really take care of themselves at home and the nuclear families now it's very difficult to get carers so uh, they actually asked us what is the figure of the people who need that and we don't have that figure to be able to substantiate that that's needed so maybe hospice council could work on that yeah um well, we hope we, we don't work in a government, so that's a little hard, but we try. So this year we came out with a palliative care needs assessment, which is actually an understatement of, of the numbers because they were only looking at end of life. So if you have read that in the news, we, Hospice Malaysia has produced a palliative care needs assessment um, covering the numbers that we think need palliative care, but it's really only end of life. So it doesn't, it's an underestimate. So we've been trying to push um, Richard, Dr. Richard Lim, who is the national care advisor, to kind of push palliative care forward. Um, so we hope that he will take on this responsibility. And in Malaysia, you know, the numbers. We don't have good data, so that's hard. Um, for pediatrics, we're just starting to look at the death um, audit, the death study of all the children who die in hospitals and see whether we can come up with, with some figures. But um, in UK, for kids, they have quoted um, 32 per 10,000 kids will have palliative care needs. And um, in adults, I think they have a figure for, for end of life only. So there are figures out there um, of different groups, not, not totally palliative care, but there are figures we can use. And, and I think if we can have better data um, in Malaysia, that, then we will have some figures. Yeah, thanks.